we've all been taught. We live on an average globular planet within an average solar system within an average galaxy. Relatively speaking, our home is a mere speck in an infinite universe. We've been taught that this speck of a planet is spinning on a rotational axis once every 24 hours or over a thousand miles per hour at the equator. Furthermore, the planet is supposedly orbiting, perpetually falling around the sun once every 365 days, or almost 20 miles per second. On top of that, our solar system is orbiting the galactic center at over 140 miles per second. And if all that wasn't enough, our galaxy is hurling through space at a whopping 1.34 million miles per hour in the direction of the constellation Hydra. World leaders and the official pontificates of science would have us believe that life itself is an accident. A cosmic game of chance usually results in lifeless barren planets, but once in a while the chaotic universe will birth a planet that falls in the Goldilocks zone of its host star, meets certain chemical compositional requirements, and eventually circumstances can produce a so-called primordial ooze which allows for a chemical reaction that somehow morphs into amino acids and then single cell organisms, then bacteria, and on and on until one day, under the perfect circumstances through a process called natural selection, eventually intelligent life can emerge. They would have you believe that life on Earth isn't anything particularly special. And there's probably millions of other worlds within the infinite vastness of the universe which host intelligent life effectively making our existence just another case of insignificant life in the universe. To be clear from the get-go, the idea of evolution and the globular Earth idea are just that, ideas, theories. You'd think that if this type of evolution was indeed the true origin of human life, there would be some verbal or written history that jives with these theories. Unfortunately for the proponents of these theories, most civilizations in this world will never reflect a history of evolution, but rather that of divine creation. Sad fact is, our species is suffering from a form of mass amnesia wherein we do not know our origins, we really don't know how we came to exist on this world, or do we? Up until recently, you would have asked me what type of planet we live on, I would have regurgitated exactly what NASA reports as fact. If you're not aware of the United States government recruiting Nazi intelligent agents, scientists, and engineers immediately after World War II, you need to stop this video and do some research on the origins of NASA, Project Paperclip, and Werner von Braun, the Nazi origins of NASA. You'll be surprised to learn that after the Nazis were defeated in World War II, there was a frantic clamoring between Russia and the United States to stake claims in the Nazi intelligence, personnel, scientists, engineers, technologies, and resources. During the Nuremberg trials after World War II, Nazi scientists were secretly smuggled into America by our very own government by the thousands. The History Channel would have you believe that we took in a few dozen of the top minds in Germany. The magnitude of this understatement cannot be understated. We took in countless thousands of Nazi scientists, gave them immunity for any crimes against humanity they might have participated in during the war, and kept this information from the United States citizens for over 50 years. Our government took in thousands and thousands of the brightest Nazi minds and paid them to spearhead programs like NASA. If you aren't aware of the Nazi origins of NASA, then this might come as a surprise to you, but NASA is nothing more than a pack of professional liars, pseudoscientists, charlatans, Freemasons, and Mormons. They've asserted their scientific godhood status, wherein no one can question their official line without being rid ridiculed and dismissed as stupid or crazy. If you write the textbooks that physicists study to pass an exam, aka vomit regurgitation, Anyone who doesn't conform to your paradigm will never make it as a student or a scientist for that matter, and will therefore never challenge your preconceived, pre-approved paradigm. You may not be aware that every single astronaut in American history was either a Mason or a Mormon or both. Now, I don't have anything against your average Mason or your average Mormon per se. However, both Masons and Mormons have sworn a blood oath to a secret brotherhood that trumps any other oath they might have subsequently taken. 
One of the Ten Commandments of Christianity, for example, involves not bearing false witness or not lying. One of the only commandments of Masons is to not divulge Lodge secrets, and that includes lying your ass off about the Lodge's true purpose, if necessary. Most Masons are in the Blue Lodge, or introductory three degrees, wherein they are misled as to the true meanings of certain concepts involved with Freemasonry. But they are also misled into believing that they have a firm grasp of the same concepts. This is proof positive that most Masons are probably well-meaning, honest people with good intentions, but they are unwittingly participating in Luciferian practices. With all that being said, do you really want to take what a group of Nazi Freemasons and Mormon scientists state as absolute fact without checking it? Do you really trust NASA as an unquestionable source of scientific truth? Now I'm probably picking on the Nazis a little bit too harshly here as World War II was a manufactured event, planned and executed by powerful global elites with the end goal being the overnight ruination of the sovereign German people and the creation of the nation state of Israel, all in accordance with biblical prophecy. You don't need to believe in the truth of biblical prophecy to realize that the global controlling elite must use the biblical prophecies as a strategic playbook. It's even been argued that Hitler was in fact a Khazarian Zionist placed in his position in order to justify the homecoming of all Jews to the new Israel with utter disregard for the Jews and other races in the concentration camps because those Jews were mingling with the Goyen or sullying their perfect superior bloodline. But that's a topic for another discussion. I will state, however, that the very same secret cabal that was responsible for fomenting and funding World War I and World War II are most certainly responsible for the false flag 9-11 tax and the subsequent abandonment of U.S. civil liberties. The militarization of the American police and the domestic spying programs such as the Patriot Act, which were propped up by the convenient pretext created in September of 2001. These people plan so far ahead that it typically takes generations for their plans to come to fruition. While they are incredibly patient, they'll always try to accelerate their agenda whenever possible. This is blatant proof of foreknowledge on the part of the neoconservatives who took over our government when W. Bush was elected. The project for the New American Century's manifesto, Rebuilding America's Defenses, was a mission statement type document wherein neoconservative Republican plutocrats describe the need for catalyzing event or a new Pearl Harbor in order to catapult America into their vision of the 21st century wherein America will be thrown their new world order. Now during the late 50s, mere years after the end of World War II when the Nazi NASA was being created, there was a vacuum of power in Europe. America and Russia began a frantic contest to suck up German technology and resources, which ultimately coalesced into the so-called Cold War that my generation grew up in. The United States and Russia's rocket technology was utter crap when compared to the German technology. If you compare the German Super Tiger tanks to the U.S. Shermans, you'll have a basic understanding of what type of engineering advantages Germany held above the U.S. and all other contemporary nations. In other words, the United States was lusting after the power held by the Nazis. This statement must be true, otherwise our government never would have allowed Nazis like von Braun to enter America with immunity, let alone give them huge salaries and the latitude to run national programs such as NASA. It's worth mentioning that George W. Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, was caught trading with the enemy by providing financing, oil, and steel for the Nazi war machine. Elements of our government have been in bed with and on board with the Nazi brand of fascism since the beginning, which in summary was the belief in a master race of superior beings who possess the right through power to control the world. Yes, all powerful men crave nothing if not absolute power. Now ask yourself a question. How can you control an entire world full of sovereign people? The answer isn't by force because if you force your will upon people violently they will invariably rebel against the oppressor and their head or the heads of their descendants will eventually end up on a pike. 
The only way you can truly control the entire world is through deception. For the last 100 years, give or take, people have known the Earth to be a globe, and they have known that humans evolved from apes. Without any proof, these two theories in particular have been taught in public schools as absolute fact, sort of like a strong faith in a gospel. <clears throat> During the 1960s, NASA put an end to any debate regarding the shape of our world by traveling to the moon and taking a few pictures of the Earth from half a million miles away. Or did they? It has now come to public knowledge that the moon landings were 100% fake. Even the pictures they took of Earth, and I use the term loosely, on that journey were demonstrably false. However, these very same pictures are the only such pictures in circulation. This includes all science textbooks, documentaries, and lectures that show the exact same fake picture over and over and over again. In case people started getting tired of that picture, they changed it up a little bit by flipping the image over 180 degrees. Yep, they just turned it upside down and asserted that it was a totally different picture of the Earth. The image of the world you're viewing is the only real picture of the Earth used in every textbook, every documentary. This, this image was a hoax perpetrated on the world by the NASA Nazis. The fact is that no astronaut has ever been to the moon, nor has any mancraft been any further than the so-called low Earth orbit, or beneath the Van Allen radiation belts. These are barriers made of uh, toxic radiation that encompasses our planet, which make it impossible for any living being to pass through them without being fried. And none of the fallen angel named missions, Apollo, Mercury, Gemini, all names of fallen angels, were equipped to deal with such levels of radiation. The fact is that NASA wasn't aware of the Van Allen belts when they allegedly went to the moon, so they simply didn't have to prepare for them. There was no lead lining or radiation shielding in the capsule, so the astronauts would have literally been fried like a microwave when they passed through the Van Allen belts on the way to the moon. So how did they get through the Van Allen belts? Well, uh, according to the astronaut themselves, those belts hadn't been discovered yet so they didn't need to worry about them. So let me say that again. When Bart Sibrel asked the astronaut how they were able to traverse through the Van Allen belts on the way to the moon, he was told by the astronaut that he didn't think they had gone through the Van Allen belts, but if they did go through them, the mission wasn't affected because the said belts hadn't been discovered yet. So by this logic, we should assume that being ignorant of a natural force magically excuses us from experiencing its effects. So with that line of thought, we should assume that gravity didn't affect anyone prior to Isaac Newton. So anyone prior to that Apple incident just floated away into the abyss of space. The reason our space program has never returned to the moon is because they never went to the moon to begin with. They could not continue faking trips to the moon and there wasn't any further motivation to do so. Their mission had already been accomplished in fact, the sole purpose of the Apollo missions was to produce proof that the Earth was a globe and end all the debate once and for all. Once this was accomplished, there wasn't any further reason to trick people into believing they are able to visit the moon, other than the fact that they did make trillions of dollars from the U.S. taxpayers. But again, their mission wasn't about money. It was about world domination. If you want any more information on the moon landing hoax, check out A Strange Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, astronauts gone wild, and just take a look at the International Space Station hairspray hoax, and how Stanley Kubrick filmed the moon landing hoax and revealed the story subliminally in the cult classic film The Shining. Okay, so now that we have a basic understanding of the foundations of NASA and how they are inherently a deceptive Nazi organization, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that they have lied to us in order to gain control over our wealth but more importantly, our collective paradigm. The fact that our government conscripted foreign enemies to run our so-called space program is a testament to the fact that we no longer have a constitution to protect. How is our government protecting the constitution from enemies, foreign and domestic, when they have literally brought in foreign enemies to spearhead our rocket technology? It's much easier to control a globe than it is to control a potentially infinite world these facts in mind, we must totally disregard any information vomited forth from NASA, every last bit of it. If you decide to eat up the Nazi NASA vomit, you deserve the consequences.
which are fundamental misunderstanding about our place in the natural universe. In light of this information, we must verify with full scrutiny anything NASA has claimed since its very inception. They are not a trustworthy source of information, and we can no longer blindly add their ridiculous claims into our textbooks and documentaries, and ultimately purge all of NASA's poisonous lies from our collective consciousness. Contrary to popular belief, what we know can indeed hurt us, especially if what we know is total bullshit. There is no proof that our world is a planet orbiting the sun. There is no proof that the sun is 93 million miles away or that the moon is nearly 240,000 miles away. And finally, there is no proof that our world is a globe. There is, however, empirical evidence that suggests our planet is in fact as flat as a fritter and that the sun and moon are much closer than we've been told. I'm going to touch on some of the most important pieces of evidence that need to be either explained or disproven, which demonstrate that our world is indeed a plane, meaning a flat surface, and it is not a globular speck of dust orbiting the sun. Air travel. East to west flight times are the same as west to east flight times. If the earth was actually spinning at a thousand miles per hour, then a westbound flight should take at least twice as long as an eastbound flight. Horizons always eye level, regardless of altitude. If you are on a globe, the higher up you go, the lower the horizon should appear relative to distance. In fact, there should be an exponential effect wherein the horizon would appear to drop lower and lower as you gain altitude the further away you look. Eventually, once high enough, you wouldn't be able to see the horizon at all. I've been on several airline flights and I've never seen the horizon drop off in the distance. And no, you cannot see the curvature of the earth in an airplane window. Either the windows are fisheye glass, which makes any straight line appear curved, or you have been so brainwashed that you render the perfectly flat horizon as a curve in your own brain. Even if earth was a globe, you wouldn't be able to detect such a curve with, on the horizon from an airplane as a sphere would simply cease to be visible below the horizon at a drop-off point. This simply isn't the case because we're not on a sphere. You would, however, on a sphere, see the horizon drop lower and lower as you gain altitude and look further away until the horizon would finally disappear beneath itself. Since we're not on a globe, we instead see a perfectly flat horizon at eye level as far as the eye can see, no matter how high an altitude we may climb. This is a flat world, not a sphere. Furthermore, if you are on a globe, what you should see is the higher you are in altitude, the horizon should appear to drop exponentially the further and further you look away. You should see buildings appear to angle away from you the further away they get. But instead, all buildings appear to be level and flat regardless of how far away they are. Sun rays. You can see hot spots directly beneath the sun on the tops of clouds. If the sun was truly 93 million miles away, the light from it would be so diffused by the time it reached Earth, you would not see such hot spots on the tops of clouds. Also, if you've ever seen sun rays bursting through clouds, you'll notice a perspective origin of the rays, proving that the sun is much, much closer to the Earth. If the sun was indeed 93 million miles out, the ray burst through clouds would appear as parallel lines, not convergent lines. The relative size of the sun and moon, you probably have noticed that the sun and moon appear to be identical in size. NASA would have us believe that this is because the sun is exactly 400 times larger than the moon, but is also exactly 400 times further away than the moon. This is crap. Nightly moon disappearances, anyone? Have you ever noticed the moon disappear at night only to re reappear nearing the morning? No, because the sun and moon are never on opposite sides of the earth. I believe the sun is slightly larger than the moon and only slightly further away, but not 93 million miles away. Ships at sea would appear to drop lower and lower on the horizon the further away they get, while tilting away from you, apparently, the further away they get. Constellation realignment, if our galaxy was just one of a hundred billion hurling through space at millions of miles per hour, and all the other galaxies were doing the same thing, 
Wouldn't you expect to see some relative change in the night sky over thousands of years? It seems to me that the night sky has remained constant throughout history, and we still have all the same astrological configurations as the ones that were developed in ancient times. Proposed orbital patterns are too chaotic. Take a look at this video and you'll see that the law of gravity as described by Einstein's theory of relativity does not account for planetary behavior in the proposed orbital patterns. Gravity only seems to account for the planetary orbits if the solar system is standing still. But according to NASA's own theory, the sun is traveling through space orbiting around the galactic center. So how does gravity explain the vortex patterns displayed by planets here? It doesn't. There is no explanation for this computer model, and it simply doesn't work. Objects orbiting a moving body like the sun in this model would be cast out of the orbit almost immediately because there's nothing to hold the planets to these orbital patterns. Poor quality images cut into crappy animations of the Earth rotating from space. For all the countless millions spent on these space programs, the best we can get are these low resolution composites of the Earth's rotation, and the only high res animations we get are CG composites. I call bullshit. There are some excellent sources of information on the flat earth fact versus the globular soup theory, but be careful about the disinformation campaigns as always. There's literally a fake shill dummy campaign that's been around for quite a while. It's, it's either the flat earth society or the flat earth research society. It, it's one of those. One of those is uh, a joke. They make outrageous claims about the flat earth theory that are demonstrably false bring in red herring arguments to life, they effectively place the flat earth into the tabloid bucket for most people that research the topic. There are some legitimate people who mean well and seem to be mostly correct about the reality of this situation. On the other hand, you also have some legitimate sounding people who want to smear this discussion by speaking truth mixed with obvious fiction and will attempt to derail this discussion by any means possible. This is the discussion they don't want you having. This ties in so perfectly to all the other modern conspiracies perpetrated upon us by the elite cabals in power. If we can bring this discussion to life, we might just have a chance at beating this great deception. I don't think that anyone has all the answers at this point, but I personally agree very strongly with the facts surrounding our flat world, and very strongly disagree with the half-truths and total bullshit that has been half-heartedly shoveled on our proverbial heads by the Nazi NASA. A couple of guys who I strongly recommend and have borrowed some clips for this video are Math Boylan, the NASA channel on YouTube. Math is a hyper-realistic painter, stand-up comic, and a total fucking trip. This dude seems to be pretty smart and was apparently a private contractor for NASA, specializing in ultra-realistic renderings of hypothetical alien worlds with attention to specific lighting scenarios based on predefined mock celestial events. You really need to look at this dude's YouTube channel as he is responsible for breaking much of the insider information in terms of how NASA operates. Time-lapse footage of the Earth from space. Video footage sped up. But the clouds don't mutate. If it's a ball, why are you faking all the footage? Huh? Why, why, why are you faking the size of continents relative to real driving distance from one coast of Canada to the other and Russia on a toy globe. If it's a ball, it's a ball. Put everything in the skin. You tell me you can fit Canada twice to the length of Russia? If it's a ball, why are you faking it? If it's a ball, why does it look like a cartoon? If it's a ball, why do people say, I believe it's a ball? If it's a ball. But why is it still the theory of gravity? Improve it. You only need the theory of gravity if it's a ball. That's how the whole equation starts. So, it's not a ball, you don't need gravity. Gravity's just there to explain why the fucking shit's not flying off if we're spinning a thousand miles an hour. It's temperature. This is ether, this is air, gas, whatever you want to call it, ether. The original word was ether. You know, the space is between things. And it's got temperature. If it gets too cold, I get affected. If it gets too hot, uh, my skin will melt. Underneath me is stuff that will melt my skin. You see it see, shoot out of volcanoes. I got dirt, rock, minerals, navy oil, deposits, then I got lava. 
Don't talk to me about the candy Santa, the goth stop, stopper of Earth where, where there's layers of, of candy bar with like a chewy chocolate Santa that's nickel or iron. Or I used to ask in geography. And then underneath the lava is iron. And I'm like, how'd you get through the lava to know there's iron? Matt, get out of class. They call me disruptive. They call me disruptive in geography. The class would laugh, but I would be kicked out because I was making jokes. No, I, I was a sincere question. How do you know the center of the earth is nickel if you got to go through, you know, this many hundreds of miles of, of molten magma lava? It's funny, eh? the center of the earth is cartoons. Your maps are cartoons. Those aren't the real sizes of the countries. The toy globe is inaccurate. It's, it's a toy. That's how inaccurate it is. It's a toy globe. But apparently, you can't make everything to scale if it's a globe. As long as it's three parts. Matt seems to assert that our world is an infinite plane and it resides within a bucket of sorts, flanked on all sides, 360 degrees, by ice wall known as Antarctic. Now, according to this model, and I happen to agree with Matt's model, there's a strong magnetic field at the center, which is the North Pole. And this actually happens to be the epicenter of the entire universe. All celestial bodies, including the sun, the moon, and the wandering stars, AKA the fallen angel planets, Saturn, Mars, Mercury, Venus, all named after Nephilim. Matt believes, and again, I agree, that our world is in a fixed position where essentially nothing meets matter, Beneath the surface of the Earth, you have hot magma, and when this comes in contact with the nothingness, it cools and coalesces into the solid Earth that we walk upon. Everything in the night sky is in fact perpetually rotating around this magnetic center. In this model, our world is probably one of many, or even one of an infinite number of worlds that are contained within the plane. Now, on the other hand, you have uh, Eric DeBay, who is an accomplished author, world traveler, hippie dude who seems pretty cool in a creepy new age kind of way. Matt Boylan seems to think that he's a shill because he reports that the Earth is, while flat, still an enclosed system with physical or metaphysical boundaries above and around it, also totally flanked by a two mile tall ice wall known as the Antarctic. Now in this system, there's probably a dome or a boundary at some point if you go up high enough into the sky. According to Eric, the ice wall marks the end boundary of the world, and the dome marks the end point of sorts in the sky. I agree with Matt's model for a few reasons. One of the biggest reasons is because if the Earth was an enclosed system, as Eric DeBay suggests, I don't see the world's powers going to such lengths to suppress its flatness. I can, however, see them desperately trying to suppress the fact that the Earth we're standing upon is potentially limitless. I believe, rather, that the Earth is an infinite plane and that the only enclosure to our system is the superficial boundary of the outer wall known as Antarctica. I stand to be corrected on this, but with the evidence available to me at the time, this very well may be the case. Now, right now, as we speak, every military in the civilized world has a responsibility of keeping anyone who tries to go to the outer wall out. If this was just another continent covered in ice, why would they want to keep people, and more importantly, corporations, out of the Antarctic? Do some digging into the expedition of Richard E. Byrd, and you'll find that he found out in the 1930s that Antarctica was rich in raw materials and fuel sources that would have proved to be invaluable for the industrialized world. You'd expect to see huge migrations of corporate interests into the Antarctic to extract metals and fuels for the next several hundred years. And instead, after the 1930s expeditions, it was actually closer to the 50s, where all countries simply pulled out of the Antarctic and signed a treaty that bans any person or business from setting foot on the outer wall. And this treaty isn't even open for discussion for another 25 years. This is going to be a tough thing for people to let go of. I'm not expecting anyone to just recklessly abandon their lifelong paradigm just because of these claims. Do your own research, come to your own conclusions, but don't be dismissive or you might end up on the wrong side of history. Speaking of motives, what motive would the powers that be have to suppress this information? Up until the late 1800s, there was a lively debate on the topic of whether the Earth was flat or a sphere. 
Since the technology didn't exist, they could only debate and measure the aspects that were measurable at the time. And we're slowly becoming aware of the Luciferian movement to destroy the relationship between man and his creator. Every chance they get, they will denounce God or the Bible as fiction. So by proving that the Earth was a globe, Nazi NASA effectively proved that God was a liar and did not create the Earth as a fixed plane for humans to hold dominion. But furthermore, so many scientists have their reputations tied up in theoretical physics based on the globular Earth model, it will crush their paradigm, so they'll do anything to keep this information suppressed. New York City skyline, Midtown, Midtown Manhattan, from Bear Mountain, New Jersey, 60 miles upstate. Where is the curvature? Where? No curvature. The buildings aren't curved over. Empire State Building is straight up, straight on the flat earth.
the curvature where good afternoon brothers and sisters I just want to show more good afternoon brothers and sisters I just want to show more definitive proof that you live on a flat earth now you're looking at the Philadelphia skyline that was photographed 30 to 40 miles from Apple Pie Hill in New Jersey Pine Barrens. Now this is just another impossibility that you see the Philadelphia skyline 40 miles away approximately on the horizon. Okay? Samuel Burley Rowbottom, better known throughout the scientific community as Parallax. In 1881 he had published this book, Earth Not a Globe. Outlining dozens of experiments performed over many years, it quickly became the standard authority for anti-globularists. Perhaps the most significant experiments were those carried out on a canal known as the Old Bedford Level. Located in Cambridgeshire, England, the canal is perfectly straight over an uninterrupted six-mile stretch. While there, Parallax conducted many experiments, all towards one conclusion to prove that the surface of the water in the canal was indeed perfectly flat. In one experiment, a boat carrying a flag rode from one bridge to another six miles away. An observer with a telescope placed eight inches above the surface of the water found that the flag and the boat were distinctly visible throughout the entire distance. If the Earth is a sphere with a circumference of 25,000 miles, then over a distance of six miles, the second bridge should mathematically be 16 feet below the observer's eye line. Here, you can see the New York City skyline from 60 miles upstate in Bear Mountain. 60 miles upstate and you can see the Freedom Tower. No curvature, 60 miles away. This is Bear Mountain. Here's another image from Harriman State Park way upstate about 60 miles from Manhattan there's the Manhattan skyline on the flat earth how could you see the Manhattan skyline perfectly flat from 60 miles away how brothers and sisters I want you to know that there is a spot in New Jersey Washington's Rock where with the right camera you could see both skylines of New York and Philadelphia in opposite directions at the same time. New York City and Philadelphia are 120 miles apart, but yet from Rosh Washington's Rock in New Jersey, the Philly skyline and the New York skylines can both be visible at the same time in opposite directions.
You couldn't hear it in the vacuum of space. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No. Now, I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. Beginning at an altitude of 1,000 miles and extending an additional 25,000 miles lay lethal bands of radiation called the Van Allen radiation belts. Every space mission in history with humans on board, from both the United States and Soviet Union, from the first in 1961 to the present, has been well below this deadly radiation field. Mercury, Gemini, Soyuz, Skylab, the Space Shuttle, all maintained altitudes well below 1,000 miles. All except Apollo. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt. And if we did, it wasn't a problem. We, if we were going to encounter it, then we would have had to build the spacecraft and the spacesuit to, uh, to, to not give humans a problem. You, you don't just build something and hope it works. You study to see what uh, the threats are, the environment is, and then you say, how thick do I have to make the metal on the spacecraft so that going through this kind of radiation or these kind of meteoroids, it won't get hurt. And so and then we build it that way. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above then, the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -hmm. We didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt. But we didn't feel it inside, and we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. In 1998, the space shuttle flew to an altitude of 350 miles, one of its highest altitudes ever, hundreds of miles below the beginning of a field of radiation that was so severe that the astronauts inside of their shielded spacecraft and inside of their shielded spacesuits saw flashes of light with their eyes shut that they described as shooting stars due to radiation penetrating first the shuttle's shielding, then their spacesuit shielding, then their skulls, and finally the retinas of their closed eyes. As a result, CNN issued the following report, noting NASA's unpredicted surprise. The radiation belt surrounding Earth may be more dangerous for spacewalking astronauts than previously believed. Scientists say the phenomena known as the Van Allen belts can spawn killer electrons when the Earth's magnetic field changes. These electrons that are being studied could have an important effect not only on satellites, which has happened in the past, but could also affect the astronauts by creating large doses of radiation that could influence their health. The electrons can penetrate through various materials, including spacesuits, and can pass through, in fact, the walls of the space station and can create high charges deep inside of these objects. No strange. Uh, occurrences. Mm -mm, nothing like that. The uh, space shuttle. To, uh, go ahead. The space shuttle went to 365 miles a few years ago uh -huh. because I worked in news. Uh -huh. I saw CNN. They said that the radiation belts surrounding Earth are more dangerous than previously believed because the astronauts saw shooting stars with their eyes closed. Oh, Just man, when they that got within from 600. Radiation belt. We saw shooting stars, but they're not shooting stars from with your eyes closed, although they look like it. Uh, if you're out in space beyond the Van Allen belt, and probably within the Van Allen belt, and close your eyes, and just pay attention. You don't notice it unless you pay attention. Then all of a sudden you'll see a little flash, like a shooting star, except it's like that. There goes one this way. Then one just blossoms. And then not that fast. Maybe you wait three minutes or two minutes, and one goes whoosh. Then you see them whistling by. Not on our mission, by the way, they hadn't been discovered yet. Then you see them whistling by. Not on our mission, by the way, they hadn't been discovered yet. Then you see them whistling by. Not on our mission, by the way, they hadn't been discovered yet. I saw them one day. We'll have a lovely afternoon Kiss the world goodbye And away we'll fly Destination moon We'll travel fast as a light Till we're out of sight 
The earth will be like a toy balloon. Oh, what a thrill you get riding on my jet. A destination moon. Oh, we'll go up, 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 up. Straight to the moon, we too. High in the starry blue. I'll be out of this world with you. So away we'll steal in my space mobile. A supersonic a honeymoon. Leave your cares below, pull the switch, let's go. A destination moon. Dr. Von Braun, how would you say we stand in relation to the Russians, and do you think we can ever catch up? I'm convinced that in the space field, the Russians are ahead of us, particularly in uh, large weightlifting capability. And uh, that at the moment, the problem is not so much to catch up, but first build up the working speed that they have already demonstrated. After we are running as fast as they do, there's still a considerable gap to close, and only uh, the future will tell whether we'll manage to close that gap. We cannot and will not ever get into this race as we should, so long as all of our objectives are short-term objectives. We've got to have no finite end to our objectives. The end of our objectives should be as far as we can see at any given time. But right now, we need a 10 to 12 year program that has as its ultimate goal the man domination of space. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. We must assure our preeminence in the peaceful exploration of outer space, focusing on an expedition to the moon in this decade. T minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Good luck and Godspeed. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 30